Okay, so in this lecture we're going to cover the Java messaging service. So, previous lecture and this lecture about technology for large-scale enterprise applications which run across the internet. So we got, you know, Tesco's invo inventory invoice system, systems linking up banks, ATMs and so on, government systems for health and tax. They're all like big, heavy-duty systems running lots of software in a distributed manner. So, you know, when you go into Tesco and you buy a piece of broccoli, you know, they sort of do the pinging thing on the till, and somewhere or other there'll be an, like a, a local inventory system probably um, that records the fact that you've bought some broccoli. There'll be some kind of, uh, that fact will be recorded in all the data gathering done by Tesco linked to your club card account about how much you like broccoli on a Tuesday or whatever. And it will also be linked into some other system that will then be requesting you know, further supplies of broccoli for that particular supermarket because they'll have a careful track on how much broccoli has actually been sold from each supermarket. And then there'll be a further system, you know, that will order that broccoli from the farmer and then the farmer will get to work and, you know, grow some more broccoli for Tesco's. And the same with ATMs, you're, you know, entering, you know, your pin, chip and pin or whatever. It's being sent off to the bank, being verified with the bank, being sent back, checking your account and so on and so forth. And government systems, you know, health, tax, etc. all big, clunky, big scale stuff. Um, using a lot of this clunky big scale stuff is using this enterprise technology um, or middleware um, as I'm talking about in this talk and the previous talk. So as I explained, software is like a, this middleware is kind of glue sticking network software connected components together. As I hope I made clear in the Java RMA talk, this, this kind of using this kind of glue, using the middleware can save you an awful lot of trouble if you're building this kind of large scale application. Because if you get a bunch of guys to and girls to go off and write low-level socket code to link your different inv invoicing systems or your healthcare and tax systems together. Almost certainly, they write some horrible bugs into it. There'll be some glaring security flaws, and the whole thing will, you know, be really unstable and a bit rubbish. Whereas, if you have one company that's dedicated to like IBM or something like that, who spend spend all their time building high-quality middleware solutions and then selling them to other people and these other people don't have to hire programmers to do low-level socket programming, they can just hire programmers to use the middleware to, to communicate um, between the different computers. So we covered Java MI and Corba and all this kind of stuff in the previous talk. This talk I'm going to cover the, messaging, the Java messaging service and also a little bit more general information about messaging middleware. So yeah, start off with message-oriented middleware. Uh, then talk about Java Beans, which you need to you need to understand Java Beans to understand how how you can implement the Java Messaging Service. And both Java Beans and the Java Messaging Service are both sort of parts of the Java Enterprise Edition. So start with a sort of more general. Going to start with more general introduction to message-oriented middleware and sort of applications of it. And is what it says in the tin: it's software supporting the sending and receiving of uh, messages between distributed systems. So the person, so it's uh, the person sending the message doesn't need to know anything about the person receiving the message. They just fire off the message. The person receiving the message obviously needs to be able to interpret that message, but they again don't need to know anything about the, the person who sent it really. So, um, you know, it's a bit like email, as I explain later. But with email, you um, you know you write. Let's suppose you got a Mac. Um, and you're working on a particular you know, web safari or something, and you type in an email and send it off to someone. The person receiving it could be running Linux, they could be running Android, whatever. They can receive that message and process it. And the message is independent of the hardware or the operating system, this kind of stuff. And again, with email, it's a bit like email in the sense that sender and receiver don't need to be connected at the same time. The sender can send the message, and at a later point in time, the receiver can connect to the network and receive the message. Sender is not affected by temporal failure of the receiver. So, so if um, I send to a message uh, to someone who's uh, asleep, um, then they can still receive the message when they wake up. Message oriented middleware typically works through message queues, and these message queues store the messages temporarily while the destination program is busy or not connected. You can do lots of nice stuff backing up the message queues, so you, know, you can store it to a hard drive, to the cloud or whatever. And you can even do some super clever stuff about transforming the message between sender and receiver so that senders can receive, can send messages in one format and the receiver can read that message in another format. So the sort of email analogy would be 
if you sent your, if I had a friend living in Russia, let's say, I could send my email in English, and then the, the email program would miraculous, the server would miraculously translate um, my email from English into Russian, so that my Russian friend would just read it in Russian. That'd be the kind of idea. So the idea is roughly that um, you might remember the multi-threaded tic-tac turbo, tic-tac-toe system with all these threads, sockets, and all the complexity. Well, the idea is that all of this communication could be done with the message-oriented middleware, and you could probably strip out some of the intermediate classes like this connection listener. So I'll explain all that at the end. So a key uh, distinction that you need to understand within message-oriented middleware is the distinction between synchronous and asynchronous communication. So it can be used to send messages synchronously or asynchronously, um, whereas remote procedure calls and Java remote method invocation typically work synchronously, and I'll explain what the difference is there. So in synchronous communication, you pass control to the remote procedure, and then the calling procedure blocks while waiting for reply to its call. So it's a bit like a telephone call, telephone conversation. So synchronous conversation, I'm running my, I'm my client sort of running away, doing its thing, and then at some point it invokes a method on the remote object. And, then, and that's a blocking call if it's synchronous. So it's blocking call, and so the client's sitting there waiting while the, you know, all the marshalling and the unmarshalling, the server side, the invoking the remote method, you know, and then the reply being sent back over the network. All of that happens while the client's just sitting there. And then when, when it, once that's all complete, the method un returns, and then the client can continue its processing. So it's a bit like a telephone conversation because I say something, blah, 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 hello, blah, blah, blah. And while I'm saying what I'm saying, the person listening to me is just listening. They're going, yeah, yeah, very interesting, very interesting, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Then once I've finished speaking, the per the, my interlocutor uh, can then reply and then say something else. So it's like a spe I speak, they speak, I speak, they speak. It's like we're, ne we're never speaking at the same time. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to communicate. So this is synchronous interaction. So here you have a caller. They invoke the remote procedure. And once they've done that, they're doing absolutely nothing. The remote, the remote object's then doing all the processing, 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 while this is doing absolutely nothing. Finally, this thing returns, and then the caller can then get on with some more work. So you can see in this model that, um, uh, in fact, um, although we've distributed the program between this computer and this computer, we haven't actually got any more CPU time. We've only got the CPU time of effectively one computer because this, this caller is just sitting there doing nothing while the remote procedure is executing. Now, there might be other reasons why we um, are running this procedure on a remote computer, but we're not really gaining anything in terms of distributed computational performance. Now, asynchronous communication um, is the other thing, is the main advantage, uh, really, of this message-oriented middleware. In this case, the caller doesn't block and wait. It just sends off the message, continues processing, does what it does, um, a bit like sending an email. So I'm working away. I want to send off an email to John. So I write my email, send it off to John. I don't care if John's there or not, alive or dead, doesn't matter. I'm sending in that email. And, you know, and later, uh, as I'm working, I might get a reply back from John at a later point in time. All the participants are processing independently, in parallel. And that's a great advantage from the computational point of view, from the, from the point of view that I don't depend on I can send my email without knowing, without John being online or anything like that. Um, but it's more complex as well, because you have to write your code in such a way that you can handle uh, messages. You can, you can process the message. You can sort of do one thing, park what you're doing, and then start off doing another thing, and then return to it. So it's something humans are very good at, but it can be more complicated to program. So here's the idea. So here you have the producer of messages. It sends the message to the queue. And then once you send the message, this producer can keep on, keep on working. Here's the consumer. Um, once the consumer has a bit of time or whatever, they pull, or push, they pull the message from the queue, do whatever, process the contents of the message and send the reply. At a later point in time, the producer decides, oh yeah, maybe I'll look at that now. They pull the reply from the message queue and do what needs to be processed. But this, so this involves storing and retrieving context that enable us to continue working on the tasks that involve that link to the message. As I said, people are good at that. Machines are more tricky to program to do that. So message-oriented middleware is based on queues. Clients are sending and receiving messages to and from queues. And these queues are like first in, first out. So the first message that's sent to the queue is the first message that's received from the queue. So you have a bunch of producers of messages. They send these messages to the queue. 
And then the consumers in the message are pulling the messages from, from the other end of the queue. So they're like, it's, it's a queue, right? Like, a, like any old queue in the bank or whatever. Similar to email addresses, so sorry, there's two times of queue. So we've got point-to-point -point messaging in which uh, the queues are similar to email addresses. In fact, each person or each, there's a unique consumer, single consumer uh, of messages from a particular queue. So you send messages to this queue and only one client can consume messages from that queue. Each message is delivered once to one receiver. So a little bit like email in a sense. So we have a point-to-point -point queue, that's the address for this particular consumer and only one consumer received the message from that queue. Um, so it's a multi, lots of different people can write emails to consumer N or messages to consumer M, but only consumer N can receive those messages. And then we have public, publish subscribe messaging, a bit like a discussion board, you know, where you have topics. Anyone can post uh, messages to a topic, and anyone can subscribe to messages um, on a particular topic. And there's anonymity, send, anonymous sending and consumption of messages. So here are a bunch of publishers sending messages to this topic, and people can choose to subscribe or unsubscribe to particular topics to receive those messages. So lots of advantages of message-oriented middleware over remote procedure calls and remote method invocation. Firstly is this loose coupling between components. So as I said, there's two kinds of loose coupling. One is the fact that the, um, the Java MI, a local class, uses a specific interface so there's a lot of details that the local class, that the local code needs to know. There's a lot of details, implementation details shared between the local code and the remote code. Um, so it's, it's more difficult, it's more brittle, because you make any small changes to the implementation you know, of the local or remote, and you've got to update the entire system. If you change the interface, you have to change all of the code that interfa interacts with that interface. That's true to a lesser extent with messaging, because you're just dealing with messaging, with headers, you know, you can kind of, um, it's a little bit easier to adapt the systems without completely rewriting all the code. Most uh, re remote procedure call implementations have little or no guaranteed reliability communication capability, whereas with message-oriented middleware, you can have all this persistent storage of message queues, and you can guarantee reliable, guarantee the delivery of the message and check the message to be received and so on. So there's a lot of reliability mechanisms built into message-oriented middleware. <coughs> Asynchronous communication is a big advantage. The sender and receiver don't need to be online at the same time, so we don't have this problem that with remote uh, method invocation, your client calls the remote method, remote object, but what if the, that remote computer is down, right? Then you're a bit stuffed if you're trying to interact with it and the client's stuffed as well. Whereas with this, you can just send off the message. It doesn't matter if the client's online or not, the other person's online or not. Um, it's like emails are very efficient, whereas phone calls are much more laborious. They scale asynchronous communications scale more e easily than synchronous communications. And as I said, with remote procedure calls, Java RMI, for it to work, all of the components have to be online simultaneously, which can be a bit tricky to manage. Um, if there's a network failure, you're, you're a bit stuffed. Whereas with uh, message-oriented middleware, you know, the, it's much more looser coupling between the uh, different um, parts, different components, and therefore um, it's much easier to handle you know, temporary failures of one component. So I think there's really few disadvantages relative to remote procedure calls and Java RMI. Um, but as you will see when I give you the concrete example of this, um, it's, not, it's not trivial to install and maintain. Actually, Java RMI is a lot easier. You don't have all these administered objects and stuff. And in some circumstances, such as your mini projects, it'd be a lot easier to implement your own messaging or use a more lightweight solution than to go for the full enterprise, you know, enterprise installation. So it's fine if you're if your test goes, you can take a hit, spend the money on in getting all this stuff running and tested and all the rest of it. But if you're working on a smaller project, you want probably something a little bit lighter. There's lots of message-oriented middleware implementations. I mean, you know, lots and lots. Um, we're going to focus here on the Java messaging service. Right, so to understand the Java messaging service, you need to understand Java beans. Because Java beans are the core key way in, and in, the injection of dependencies in Java beans is the key way in which the whole thing's set up so that it can run. So first I'm going to talk about Java beans, then we can go on to then I'll go on to explain how, we, how the whole JMS actually works. So Java beans are classes that are serializable, so we talked about that before. That means they can be sent over a network, written to a file, and so on. They have a zero argument constructor and getter and setter methods. Those are the three features. 
So this is a nice little example of a Java bean. So it implements serializable. You might be highlighting these. Yep. It has a zero argument constructor. And it has, has these field for each of these variables, you have a getter and setter. So any other bit of code that can interact with this bean and set the name or get the name or set the ID and get the ID. That's the idea. So, and the reason for this, so the idea behind a Java bean, it's like a simple little modular Java class and we can, uh, that we can set all the variables in externally and set the dependencies in as I explain. And, and we can also like send that Java class over a network, um, save it to a file. It's a very sort of flexible modular blob of code that can, and we can manipulate uh, its contents and link it up to other bits of code. That's, that's the general idea. But the dependency injection is the thing we care about here. And I'm going to explain what that means. So with a Java bean, um, one of the, some of the variables can be classes, right? One Java class can depend on another Java class. And that means that the Java bean is dependent on another class. And this, these setter methods, like set name and get name, or set name particularly, is used to set dependencies in these classes automatically. And what this, and this, this, how this is described is, it, is that the setter method is injecting a dependency into the Java bean. So I think it's be easier with a, an example. So here we have an example. So here I have uh, one Java bean here. You know, empty constructor, serializable, getters and setters, right? And this Java bean here has this class person. Then we have the class person, also a Java bean, um, and this doesn't have any, and this just has a standard string as its variable. So a car, a car has a dependency on a person class. And when we use the setters to set, to, to set the person class, what we're saying is we're injecting this dependency into the, into the class or into the Java bean. So this is uh, an example of dependency injection here. We create a new car, we create a new person, and then we do car set owner and pass the person there. So initially, this should just be a null. So we create the bean here. We create all the beans, you know, all at once. And we can do that because they've all got zero argument constructors. And then what we do is we, set, we link them together by injecting them into each other using the setters. So in this case, we inject. So we create this bean, create this bean, and then we inject this instance of this bean into this, into this, into this instance of this bean, thereby enable so that when we want to do things with the person, when this car class needs to do things with the owner, it will have the owner class there already for it to use. Now, this is often done uh, using the Spring library. This is a Java library that lets you set, to, like, um, lay out or describe the dependencies of a set of classes, and then Spring will go away and inject all those dependencies automatically for you. So if you're writing a really complex Java application with maybe 10 classes or more, I strongly recommend you use Spring because it makes it much easier for them to, for the classes that need to talk to each other to talk to each other. <coughs> so I, I use this in, a, in my MIDI audio, my music system because it's much easier. Much e gives a much easier way of linking everything together with a little bit of an overhead in creating all these XML files, but that's not such a big deal. And what Spring works is, how Spring works is you have an XML file in which you describe all the different beans that, that, that are involved in the system. So here we have a, each bean has an ID here, that's the ID of the person bean, and a particular class. So here you have an instance of a person bean that it will create, and an instance of a car bean. And this car bean has a, a reference to a person bean, right, as we explained. So one of the properties of the car bean is um, that it has, a, has an owner, and this reference means that it's saying that this bean should be injected into this bean. So what Spring will do behind the scenes, it will create these two instances of the person bean, the car bean, and inject this person into this car so that the car can then access, access the person that's been created. So that's Spring. We're not, I'm just using that as an example. Um, how this actually works with uh, JMS is that we use the JNDI lookup service. It's called the Java Naming and Directory Interface, Jin, yet another acronym with N's and I's and J's. So it's JNDI to look up the dependencies of a class. And so you look up the dependencies of JNDI and inject them automatically in exactly the same way as Spring does. I'm going to cover this in the next section. So again, don't confuse Java RMI with Java, I, J, Java Native Interface or with Genie, which is you know just Genie. 
and with GNDI, it's, it's, it's an absolute nightmare, these Java acronyms, right? Okay. So, now I've covered JNDI and beans and dependency injection, we can then explain, I can then explain how the Java messaging service works. You'll be pleased to know there's some jobs. I even applied for a job last year that had JMS um, as one of its uh, requirements, uh, which I didn't get because I didn't know much about JMS then. Uh, perhaps amongst other reasons. So, what we get with JMS is loosely coupled communication with adjustable level of reliability. So you can make it super rock solid enterprise and all that, or you can maybe make it a bit faster and looser. As I said, the sender receiver message don't have to be running at the same time. The components don't need to know much about their inter each other's interfaces. It's loose coupling, it's just like email, and it facilitates communication when there's no need for immediate response. You can file off a message and get a response much later. So you can have guaranteed delivery, checking that the message was actually delivered, maybe even acknowledgements. Even if partial failures are occurring, the, the recipient should get, get it eventually. As I said, you can store all the message queues, um, and, you know, and then when the receiver becomes available, you can then you know, uh, deliver the actual messages to the receivers. Supports both synchronous and asynchronous. I'll give you a quick example of both. As I said, you get acknowledgement. You can set priority levels for messages, time to live, expiry of messages, um, and you know, as I said, you can receive the script messages uh, when they're offline. Or when they, when they come back online, they've obviously got to be online to some extent. So JMS is superb, I imagine. I have tried it, but I uh, imagine superb for distributed enterprise systems. This example of Tesco's you know, invoicing system running across you know, many, many sites in the UK. You want to be able to send messages extremely reliably because if you miss some of these messages, you're going to lose money. Or banking systems, you know, they're going to be using that stock management systems. Government systems, if you're dealing with healthcare records, you want to be pretty sure that any changes to them are pro propagated reliably to other sites and so on. And maybe Middlesex is using this kind of stuff, I have no idea, in some parts of their enterprise uh, systems. Bad applications, well obviously you're not going to go to all this trouble of running JMS in order to um, do word processing on your local computer. And it's going to probably almost certainly going to be bad for real-time interactions. If you're doing a car racing game, you know, sending everything with JMS with all the overheads that that involves and the queues and all the rest of it, forget it. And it's going to be pretty rubbish for streaming. I think they have a streaming media message types, but you know, you're not going to use it for streaming. We talked about streaming a few lectures ago. So JMS supports the features of message-oriented middleware that I talked about. So you can have point-to-point -point messaging, whether you're writing or sending a message to a specific queue, and then the clients receive the message from the queues, and then you have one multiple producers and a single consumer, and queues retain all the messages until they're consumed or until they expire. So yeah, there's lots of producers send the message to queue. The queue can either the messages can either expire or be held in perpetuity until they're consumed. And then publish subscribed, where you've got lots of lots of uh, producers of messages, lots of consumers of me of, from the same producers send messages to the queue anonymously, and the consumers can subscribe to receive messages from the particular topics that they're interested in. So here we have a this topic is different kind of queue, which in which lots of people can send messages to the topic and lots of people can receive messages from on that topic. So these are the main components of JMS. So we have the, the messages, these are the objects that are sent around. Uh, containing the, the data that, the, that are read. Then we've got um, the administered objects. Now this is, the, this is the tricky new stuff that you've got to get your head around a little bit. So these are objects that are created on the server and then injected into the classes that need them. Um, to, and they, then the class, when they're injected into the, they're injected into these producers and consumers and the producers and consumers use these objects to communicate using JMS. That's how it works. So it's a very sort of enterprise -y sort of way of doing things. And then we've got the JMS provider, that's the actual middleware that sticks the whole thing together and, and makes it all work. So this is the general, I think, yeah, the general, the general way in which all the components work. So we have our, so I think the connection factory, that's an administer object, so you have to set that up on the server. Then we have the destination objects, this is like queues and topics. Um, again, you set these up on the server. And then we start up a message provider, message producer and message consumer. They use, and they have the connection factory, I think, injected into, and the, they have the, these two administered objects are injected into these two classes here. 
and they use them to communicate, and they use them to, I think they use the connection factory to generate a session, and they use the session in the queue to communicate, roughly. I'm going into more detail. So messages have a header, as usual, and different types. You've got, like, you can send text, you can send objects, you can send straight bytes, streams, not sure what that is, not sure what a map is either. Um, I'm probably a hash map, maybe. Um, so to send a message to JMS, um, we create these administer objects on the server, and I'm going to tell you how to do this. I'm not going to show you because it's all a bit complicated, but I will explain in some detail how it's actually done. So we create these administered objects, like a connection factory and a destination, which can be a queue or a topic. Then we write a Java class that produces messages and a Java class that consumes the message. We deploy and run them on the server. Um, the dependencies will be ejected automatically, and they can use these dependencies to pass a message between them. That's the idea. So the administered objects, this is what's you know, new, new territory, I suspect, and take a little bit of time to get used to. So these are objects that we create. The system administrator creates these on the server. They're just Java classes that sit on the server but, and then can be using JN that are registered with a Java naming and directory service so that they can be injected into the classes that need to use them. And in JMS, these administered objects are the connection factory that are used to create a connection and the destination objects such as queue and topic um, and messages are sent to these destination objects and, and pulled from the destination objects. And these, these administered objects are injected into the classes that use them. So we've got the connection factory and we've got the destination. These are the two administered objects. So to create this in NetBeans, well, first we create an enterprise application client project and we right click and we right click on it. So this could be our producer or our consumer project. We don't have to create a separate one necessarily. And we select new other, I'll show you in the screenshots in a second, then we select the jar, glassfish, JMS resource, select the resource type, configure it if necessary, and then job done. So we've got our enterprise, so first we create an enterprise application client project, that's the starting point, and we're gonna do this to create a producer or a consumer. Then once we've got our producer, this is like my simple producer example, we, click, we select new other, and we choose to do glassfish, because it's an object um, that we're going to like add to, to the Glassfish server, and we choose to select a JMS choose to create a JMS resource, and then we can give it a Java naming and directory. Um, uh, what is it? Lookup, or whatever. JNDI name. We give it a name, and this name is very important. So in this case, we're going to JMS slash CCE three one zero Q, because that's the name we're going to use to inject the dependencies um, into the other classes. So we're deciding we're going to create a queue. You choose what kind of object you want. You can create a queue or a topic, and you can create a queue or, or a connection factory. Um, so we create, we choose to, the general attributes, whatever the JMS resource, and then some of these um, resources or administered objects need to have a specific, need to have like a name and a, need a name and a value, or you can't click next. So you probably should, if you get this error, properties have non-empty name and value, use blah blah blah. There's some kind of requirement for I think, what was this? This is like a, for a queue to have a name. This, this name has no functional significance. The functional significance is, the, is this name here. That's what really counts. <coughs> Great, so that's creating a queue and then connection factory, same idea, except we choose to create a connection factory in this case by selecting this, this thing here to create a connection factory administered object and do the same thing. In this case, we don't need to give it a name or anything like that. It's just some quirk of the, of the system. So we, this is how you add these administered objects to the Glassfish server. And you can also conveniently uh, see which ones you've actually, you can view the ones, view the administered objects on the server using this domain admin console. So you can actually view the resources that are on the server. So, if you, so this is projects, this is what the, the, the tab you've mainly been working in. You click on services, you can see the service here that we've got running. And you can right click on this, or click on it, I can't remember which, um, on the Glassfish server. And you can select view domain admin console. And this is a very handy um, interface to the server that lets you see lots of different aspects of the Glassfish server as it's running. You can administer different aspects and blah, blah, blah. But the thing we're talking about, need to look at here is the JMS resources. And we can see all the connection factories we've, got, we've added to the server and all the destination resources we've got added to the server. So here at the bottom, that was just some test I did. You can't read it very well, but it's like JMS slash CCE 310 connection factory. And that's what we added at this stage. So we added it here, gave it that name, and we can see in this JMS resources, um, we can see that name appearing there. 
and this is the JNDI name, and so we can use that name to, to inject that result, that administer object into a bean that's, that actually uses it. And here we've got the destination resources. Again, we've got JMS slash CCE 3110Q. That's the queue that we created earlier. Great, so we've got our administer objects. They're up and running on the server. We check that, all sweet and pretty. Now we need to, uh, to write the producer and consumer classes. These are Java beans that have injected dependencies. The producer sends the messages. The consumer receives the messages. And these are Java Enterprise Edition application client projects in NetBeans. So these are the, so these are the classes we need to write next, the ones highlighted in red. So as the usual, we select Java EE. And again, when you install NetBeans on your home computer, make sure you install all of, all of the optional components, including Java Enterprise Edition. You don't need C++, but you do need probably going to need HTML5, Java Web, whatever. Install as many as you can because the, you, know, you, make, you need to make sure you have the, if you can't see these in the list, you probably haven't installed all the modules that you need. So you select Java EE, select your enterprise application client, give it a name, in this case, synchronous consumer. Uh, it's going to be on Glassfish, so make sure you install Glassfish as well, by the way, or none of this is going to work. Uh, main class doesn't matter too much. Might need, might need to give it, so it's the package, and we've got the main class in this thing. Um, and then we need to inject the dependencies. So the message producing consumer, these are Java beans, and these Java beans have two dependencies. They have the connection factory, and they have a queue. When we deploy these objects on the server, the server uses J Java naming directory interface, is it, um, to look up connection factory and queue and inject them into the classes that need them. And I'll show you how that's done. So here's the Java naming directory interface I mentioned earlier. It's a bit like the domain system. It's wrapping all these different services so, um, and lets you look up a class and, have the, and then that class can be then injected into a bean in the, in the exact way I explained with the very simple example of the car and the person. And this is the mechanism we're going to use to obtain the connection factory and destination objects that we've created on the server. So the client uses JNDI to obtain references to the administered objects. It doesn't know anything about the, the naming service or how it's implemented. This is all magically happening behind the scenes. All we need to do is add a bit of annotation um, to these uh, variables in the class. So for example, uh, in our class, we might have a variable private static connection factory, and that's our connection factory. Now, if we want that to be injected from the, you, if we want a, an, ob, an administered object on the server to be injected here, all we have to do is do this annotation with the, um, you know, the at thing, resource, open brackets, look up equals that. Very, very simple. And that's why this, some of this enterprise stuff, once it's all up and running and you understand it a little bit, it becomes very elegant and simple. So all I have to do is add this line, which is just telling us, telling the, the when it's selling the NetBeans or however it's deployed, to obtain this connection factory with this, this address from the Glassfish server and inject it into, into here such that this will now point to that object running on that server. So this name here must match the administered objects on the server. That must match the administered object on the server. And if it does match, it'll be injected into this class. And this class will then, it won't be a null pointer anymore. It'll actually point to the object on the actual server. So there must be an administered connection factory class registered as JMS CCE 310 connection factory on the server. And if there is, and this is right, then it'll just, it'll just work. So, so this must match uh, the connection factory here, one of them. So these are the injected dependencies. We've got a connection factory here, which is pointing to this connection factory, this connection factory on the server. And then we've got a, a queue here that's pointing to the queue on the server, or, being, or the queue on the server is going to be injected in to, so that this variable points to it, and this variable points to the connection factory on the server. Great. So now we haven't, we haven't done anything else with connection factory here. It's not been put in the constructor or anything like that. It'll just be automatically injected, so we can just start using it, invoking methods on it, and using it to send the messages um, to the, this is the, or receive it to receive messages in this case. So this is a consumer. Now what we're going to do first is a synchronous consumer, which has a blocking receive, and then I'm going to talk about an asynchronous consumer in a second. So what we do is we use the connection factory is injected to create a connection. We use that connection to create a session, and we use that session to create a consumer. Um, that consumes messages from a specific queue. 
And then we just we start it up. Yeah, that's uh, these are the injected objects. Uh, ba, 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 ba. And then we we start it up, and I can't remember how, it's, how it receives. That's the producer. Oh yeah, and then we just start it up. Okay, let's cover the producer first, then we'll come back to the uh, consumer. So the producer just works in a similar way. It's also got the injected uh, dependencies. And in this case, it's using a queue to create a producer and using the producer to send, send some messages. So here we have the create a connection again, create the session, uh, and then we create a producer in this case instead of a consumer. And then we create a text message, set the text in it, um, and send the message. So we do that five times, send five messages. So I think it's uh, synchronous on the client side. I don't think it's uh, on the consumer side. I don't think it's synchronous on the producer side. And then to receive these messages, it uses the connection factory. Well, we said all that. Um, but it's got a blocking read of message, and it exits and receives an empty message. So, so we've got the connection, blah, blah, blah. Got the consumer, created the consumer, started the connection running. And then here's the blocking bit, right? We've got message m equals consumer.receive. So it receives one message and then extracts the message and echoes it to the command line. And this is blocking. So this will block until it actually receives a message. Um, that doesn't mean that the producer has to wait for it uh, to, to, to unpack the message. It just means that this thing isn't, um, it, it's just going to sitting there until it's actually got a message to extract. It's, it's blocking on the consuming side, I think. There's not a tight coupling between the producer and consumer. So here we have the simple outputs. So it's just a uh, simple hello from producer. That's not, I'm not certain about that, but you know, it's definitely blocking on the consumer. I'll have to check to see if it's blocking on the producer side as well. Anyway, so this is the, the um, command line output. You can just see, you can see it's working. We've got hello from producer, blah, 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 and lots of you know, crafty stuff telling us what's going on on the server and so on. So that's the producer side. It's sending the message. And then the consumer side, it's receiving the message one after the other. So the asynchronous consumer is almost the same. Uh, the only difference is uh, it can um, use as a separate class uh, this message list and the process of the messages. And uh, the, the consumer calls this class whenever a message is delivered to the queue. So this, my message list is a little bit like a handler for specific context on the Java HTTP server, if that helps. So the asynchronous consumer, here we have a we create the connection, create a session, create the consumer. In this case, we have a message listener, um, which inter implements a particular interface. And we set that message listener on the consumer, start up the connection, and then um, and what we do is we hang around um, so that the thing keeps running and doesn't shut down immediately. Um, otherwise, it'll just exit the whole program. What we want it to do is keep running. Whenever it sees a message, it invokes the message listener to handle that message. So the message listener, so yeah, let's just keep the thing running. And then the message listener just implements this message listener interface with this method on message. So whenever a message is sent, it's directed to this class, it handles the message and outputs it, and that's that. And we get a similar output. So the asynchronous consumer output, output is exactly the same thing, except it's processing it asynchronously rather than got this blocking call to read the messages from the queue. Okay, so that's very roughly a little bit of an overview how you can start to create um, use the Java messaging system. Now the software that implements the JMS interfaces provides the administrative control features, makes it all work. The glue that hangs it all together is called JMS Provider. So we've got uh, lots of different ones. We've got the Open Message Queue from Oracle, Open JMS, the Amazon Simple Queue Service. So you can run this on the cloud, I assume. And there's many like commercial enterprise systems that provide messaging messaging services between you know enterprise clients kind of thing. This one looked quite nice. I mean, when I was looking at this, this looks robust, easy to use, runs on all operating systems, supports lots of developer platforms, open source, commercially supported. So if I wanted a messaging system, I probably wouldn't bother with JMS. I'd probably look for something like RabbitMQ or some really simple, easy to use one that didn't have all this messing about with the configuration. So the performance here, um, there's a paper on the class website, and I've given a reference at the end give you some idea about performance. But uh, I think this is, what's this, blah, 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 throughput messages per second. So this is, so you're looking at, say, depends on the parameters of the network, the number of producing and consuming messages and throughput and all that stuff. You know, five, let's say maybe five to 10,000 messages per second sort of thing, maybe two to, two to 10,000, depending on the size of the messages, number of producers, number of consumers. 
So it's pretty good, right? I mean, most systems, most enterprise systems are actually fine with that. I mean, you, you're, you're talking about all of the sites of Tesco's across all of the world. They're not going to need to send more than a few thousand messages a second. So it's plenty good enough for enterprise applications. So as I've said, there's many messaging systems out there. Some will be easier to set up than others. Some might offer other fe better features. Some might offer reduced features compared to JMS. So it's like Apache, Kafka, Zero MQ, on and on and on. It'd be the same kind of idea. You've got queues, queues and topics, subscribing, asynchronous communication, all the rest of it. It's just different ways in which you put together. Now, you're more than welcome to use JMS in your mini projects. As, as you can probably see, it's a bit fiddly to set up. But once it's working, you know, it's easy to use, reliable. You could probably configure it in all kinds of ways. Personally, I would only bother with that if you've got a specific reason or if you're interested in getting better at enterprise technology or if you're interested in a job that's linked to enterprise technology. I haven't tried running across multiple machines. There may be issues with that, accessing the Glassfish server on different machines and all that. It'll probably take some work dynamically set up games, um, but you could do it. Uh, and if you're interested in this, you might have motivation to do it. One way to do it would be to have your clients, and each has a queue, so a bit like an email, and then they send messages to each other's queue. Another message, another approach would be to have a topic, so they could publish and subscribe to the topic, and the, top, and the, mess, the information about who sent it and what they did could be contained in the messages themselves. Or you could get really fancy and have like an admin topic, and then these two clients would say, hi, hello, let's play a game of tic-tac-toe, and then they pop off and play, use a separate topic to play a particular game, and then another set of clients will come up and organize another game and have the game on a separate topic. There are lots of different ways we can configure it to, you, to play the game, Obviously, it's going to be much harder to do this than to do it with a simple socketing or sockets or messaging approach that I've given you. But if you're interested and you want to do it, I'm more than happy to give you a hand. As usual, the example code's on the course website. You need to follow the instructions in these slides to make it actually work because you've got to deploy all these minister objects and all this kind of stuff. But the basic code is all there, and if, if you're welcome to have a look at that. So I said, here's it's a classic distributed system type thing. So there's... Um, Few, few chapters there that might, might be useful for you, as well as the performance paper. There's also a book on it. As usual, I don't find this terribly helpful, and unfortunately, it doesn't have a picture of an animal this time. So, you know, a little bit of sadness associated with, the, with that book. And then we got a, and that's it. So, in this lecture, I've explained how the Java messaging service works, and we're going to go on. So, we've had enough of this enterprise stuff. We've done a couple of, you know, rather heavy lectures on the enterprise things. So now we're going to talk about distributed data processing next and how you can do it.